Today by Zoom. Welcome to the October 14th meeting of the Rotary Club of Louisville. I'm Ken Grossman, President of Executive Image, Custom Club Leaders, and Vice President of the Club. President Gene, who's usually here, is at the large club conference in Cincinnati this week. And President elect, he's the smart guy, he's gone fishing. <laughs> to provide our invocation today is Luke Schmidt, Rotarian, and one of the best past presidents we've ever had. Thank you, uh, Ken. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day and for this opportunity to come together in fellowship through the Rotary Club of Louisville. <clears throat> we thank thee for the 375 plus members of this club, each of whom is a servant leader who wants to make a difference in this community by providing their time, talent, and treasure. We thank thee for members such as Rick Harnett, who reminds us of the needs of others in less fortunate parts of the world. Dr. Bobber, who teaches us how to respect and learn from others who may be different in terms of race and religion. Larry Swan, who helps us identify people here in Lowell who are challenged by homelessness, addiction, and the need for better access to health care, and countless other members of this club who do good things in our community every day. We ask that you guide this club as we go forward and help us identify areas where we're working together, we can make things better. And finally, we ask that you bless and watch over our troops who serve selflessly around the world to keep us safe here at home. Amen. Thank you, President Lou. Now to lead us in the pledge of the four-way test is Brett Corbin, financial advisor at the Corbin Financial Group of Raymond James. All right, we'll start off with the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic of the One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the four way test. Is it true? Is it fair? Is it fair? Will they build goodwill and better friendships? Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Rotarians, you may be seated. It's always a pleasure to welcome guests. Um, our featured speaker today has brought a very special guest. I'd like to welcome Butch's mother, Ms. Diane Moser. There's Lamar Young, Thomas George III. The Office of the Mayor, Care of Mackey, the Special Events Coordinator. Welcome. Okay. Please take this time to introduce yourself, then your guests. Guests, please stand and be recognized when your name is called. Well, referring to you as a vice president. Vice president, <laughs> just call me Kenny G. Well, that's that's right. Right. Well, Kenny G works probably as well as it. right. And, uh, and, uh, Jay Mallory, executive vice president of Manage West, I guess, is from the Bachor, and she's the Lisa. I'm sorry, didn't bring my notes. <laughs> uh, she's the founder of Lander Enterprises. Your Excellency, uh, <laughs> double blade for. I have with me Jennifer Hancock, who is a dear friend and president of Volunteers for America, VOA, also known as Rockstar. Oh, I'm going to introduce, so oh, hi, <laughs> Elizabeth Strell, Director of Medicare Retention Strategy at Humana. I'm going to introduce Tammy Owens, who's also here from Humana. We didn't know each other before today. <laughs> But she is joining today. She's interested in joining the club. So please give her a warm welcome. Hi, 
All right, good afternoon. Uh, Delene Taylor, Chair of the Speakers Committee, uh, CPA with DMLO CPAs. And I have a table full of guests. Hopefully some of them are on their way. I have Alice Shade, who was here with us last week. She is a strategic consultant and entrepreneur in residence at the University of Louisville. I have Lisa Shardine, who is the founder of First Hour Grief Response, uh, which is a nonprofit that helps people who have experienced sudden loss navigate those waters. With her is Jim Evans, who is the Director of Development for First Hour Grief Response. Um, I have Angelica Wilson, who is the controller for the WHS, WHAS Crusade for Children and program director, I believe, for the National Association of Black Accountants. And hopefully on the way, I have Tara Lavelle, who is the president and CEO of the Black Community Development Corporation. Dana Johnson, who is the senior director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for GLI. And I'm going to butcher her name. Does somebody know Oramigi with bone? Am I, am I saying any of that? Or, yeah, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met her in person. This is a, someone that I've connected with online. And I think maybe um, they're on their way. So if you get a chance after the meeting, please welcome them. Oh, there's Dana right there. Hi, Dana. <laughs> Welcome, guests. If you'd like to learn more about our club, please stay after the meeting for a brief what is rotary session. And generally, Craig Sherman, is it Craig back there? Craig, or are you, uh, you, you want to wait for Craig? Uh, Craig Sherman will be back there for what is rotary table, and he'll give you a brief session on, on uh, joining our club. So, with uh, President Gene and President Elect walled out to town today, you probably noticed already, I'm presiding over the meeting. So uh, we're excited to do that. And out of respect for Gene, I want to start with today's Cajun culture question, which of course I'm not a Cajun. So I'm going to give this a little different twist. <laughs> Who's out there? Please <laughs> support our. Of course, uh, so as an Indiana University graduate, I'm part Hoosier. So Kentucky has a Wildcats, Louisville, the Cardinals, North Carolina, the Tar Heels, and so on. However, many ask, what the heck is a Hoosier? And what's the origin of the name? So uh, other than Tom Primitive, who I know knows this answer as a fellow IU graduate, can you tell can anybody tell me what a Hoosier is? Larry. <laughs> Who's there? <laughs> That's one theory. There's a few theories. It's kind of a trick question. But does anyone else? Oh, the former, like, good basketball program. Oh, former, good like, basketball program. Oh, no. That was a good football program. No, no. Um, I don't know one from bars. From pardon me? Bars. Okay. Days, okay. Or, okay. Uh, at, at the end of the night, when they closed down the bar after all the bar fights, they went around and said, Who's here? I'm honored, man. This is so esoteric. I'm going to. Honestly, I read this some time ago, and who knows whether it's true or not. But in the construction of the uh, canal in Louisville, the Indiana crew was uh, staffed, was uh, supervised by a man named Hooser, H E U S E R. So who knows? But I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <It's my third. laughs> There's another theory that is attributed to Governor Joseph Wright that uh, these are derived from an Indian word or the word corn, which was hosa, an Indian Indiana flat boatman taking corn or maize to New Orleans, ironically enough, came to be known as the Hosa men or Hoosiers. Unfortunately for this theory, search of Indian vocabularies by a careful student of linguistics failed to reveal any such word. <laughs> so, 
That one I don't know. So at any rate, the term Hoosiers has been in use since the 1840s. As the author Meredith Nicholson observed, the origin of the term Hoosier is not known with certainty. Yes, it is kind of a trick question, but it, certain it is that Hoosiers bear their name, their nickname, proud name. So you can welcome all Hoosiers here. Now, uh, here to introduce our guest speaker today is Kevin Fields, President and CEO of Louisville Central Community Center. Thank you, Jan. Um, I must say to President Jean, she should take more of these because it's been fun. <laughs> Thanks so much in these meetings, but that was great. Uh, so yeah, thank you, um, Kevin Fields, CEO of Louisville Center Community Center. And I want to start the introduction with uh, giving kudos to Lee Taylor uh, on behalf of the ZEI committee. He's doing a great job uh, with our speaker selection, as well as all of our guests. So it's good to see friends in the audience, good to see and, uh, I know Tara's on the way as well. Uh, but it, it, it certainly is an honor uh, and a privilege to introduce today's speaker, uh, a gentleman who I've come to, to know um, in a very unique way, uh, which Mosby and I have spoken to each other just about every week or every other week for the past 12, 13 months. And I've just come to have a high regard and respect for him and his work. So let me give you his bio. Which, which Mosby was born in 1972 in here in Louisville, Kentucky, and grew up in the West End off of Algonquin Parkway. He attended Mill Creek Elementary, Barry Traditional Middle, and Louisville Mill High School. Won't hold him that against them because I'm a yellow jacket. <laughs> He was active in sports since the age of six, playing football, basketball, baseball, tennis, and running track. In high school, he was the class vice president for his sophomore, junior, and senior year and the quarterback of the football team. He also ran track for male, the 400 meter, and finished fifth in the state, Kentucky State Championships. He earned a four-year football scholarship to Murray State University where he studied business management. As a starting quarterback for Murray, he broke the NCAA passing record with the longest completion streak in a single game. That's 19 in a row, and the highest completion percentage in a game, 95.7%. From college, Butch went to Germany to play semi-professional football in the GFL and the EFL, where he participated in the Euro Bowl. Uh, while in Germany, he stumbled into the music career and successfully became a recording artist, signing with RCA Records and producing a hit song, a single by the name of Bang, with Bang Bang, which went number one in Lebanon. After sports and entertainment career, he returned to the U.S. to enter corporate America working in online travel as a market manager for Hotels.com and then Expedia for seven years. He, he was asked to join a startup called GetAroom.com. He successfully played a significant role in helping GetAroom to grow into a billion dollar company before becoming majority share and sold the private equity uh, in 2018. Butch Mosby is the founder and now president of Sponsor for Success, an organization that exists to engage as a long-term community partner dedicated to supporting the future success of children, teens, adults, and families in underserved communities. So with that, I want to introduce today's speaker, my dear friend and colleague, Mr. Butch Mosby. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, that was my entire PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so I, I first want to say thank you for uh, the invite to speak uh, at the Rotary Club. Thank you uh, to me 
Uh, I have heard a lot about the Rotary Club. Surprisingly, I didn't know as much as I should have before I was invited. I had a conversation with Gene West last week. I gave you more information about what the Rotary Club does worldwide and specifically how important the global chapter is and how large it is in the nation. And so um, we're not a member, our organization is not a member yet, but more than likely we will be one of this year. So the title of my, I'm supposed to turn this on, right? <laughs> so the title of my, uh, my speech here is, you don't always need a plan. Basically, when I do a, a presentation or a speech with an organization that uh, I don't know or is new, I like to go into my history so that you know who I am. Uh, and then I think that building relationships that way uh, is a lot better than you can they say that you, you should do people with you like. So hopefully when I go through my story, you'll end up like me with you just business of collaborators together. So let's start with <laughs> turn it on. Let's start with uh, okay. Let's start with these two women here, right? So on the left side is my grandmother, which has passed away, I think maybe two or three years ago. And my aunt Abby is on the right. She passed away two or three years ago. Both passed away at 87 years old. These are my kids. Uh, and that's Isaiah, that's Sena, and Stella is in the middle. So the reason I put these two ladies on the board is because they were considered the queens of our family. Grandmother's on my father's side, Aunt Adams on my mother's side. And they both had a lot of, a lot of uh, brothers and sisters. And they also had a lot of kids. And so my grandmother had 10 kids and my Aunt Abby had nine kids. And so from that start, I ended up with 400 plus cousins. <laughs> All majority born in global majority from the West End. And so I'm born and raised also in the West End. And so this is this is some of my family here. Uh, this side of the family is my uh, father's side. That side is my mom's side, um, Charlie T, uh, Robert. And these, this is us when we were kids at my grandma's place on, uh, on Greenwood. This is my father who also passed away a few years ago at the age of 67. And he was uh, very instrumental in the community because he was always uh, the football coach or the, some, some sports coach uh, in the community. So he taught us, taught me a lot about hard work, leadership, uh, and work ethic. This is my mom who is also here today. Mom was, she was the big dreamer, the entrepreneur, reached for the stars. And she also is a, uh, a minister, and we grew up in the church with uh, Pastor Coleman at First Congregational Methodist Church, where she uh, sat in the pool, pool pit with, uh, with Reverend Coleman. And one of the greatest things that mom did for me was to enroll me in the traditional program, and I ended up going to Mel High School. Okay? And so at Mel High School, I was the class vice president. And I remember when I ran for uh, uh, vice president my sophomore year, the young lady on the left, is her name is Kim Weeks. She ended up being the president. I actually wanted to run for president and she came and talked me out of running for president. She knew that I was gonna beat her. So <laughs> I ended up running for vice president and we shared, uh, we, we were, uh, uh, a part of the school council for four for three years. I was also a fo uh, football quarterback captain of the team, ran track, ended up coming in to the place in the uh, in, in, in the state championship, and also was voted Mr. Mayor. At Mary State, uh, it's an interesting story. I was a very small quarterback. I, I thought I was good, but I was very small, and I had no offers for for college. And it just so happened 
that gives Valley in uh, at University at the Bowl Stadium. I had the best game of my life. I ran for four touchdowns and we beat Valley in overtime. And after that, I thought I was going to get all kinds of offers, and I didn't get any offers. And so we had there was a running back who was one of the tops in the state. His name was Tony Coleman. Mary State came to actually look at him, and they wanted to see football film of him. Uh, football film. They wanted to see film of uh, a playoff game, and so they saw the Valley game where I was. I ran four touchdowns, and they said, "Okay, we want Butch instead of Tony." That's how I got to Mary State. Now, another interesting story about Mary State is when they came to recruit me, they told me that we were going to play the University of Louisville on the first game. And so when I got to Mary State, there were five quarterbacks that were in front of me. And so I knew that I wasn't going to play. So I went to the coach and asked if I could move to wide receiver. And so I moved to wide receiver, which was one of the worst mistakes I've made. And I came to Louisville. And played in that game. I think that year they had Brownie Mangle and they won the Fiesta Bowl. And we got beat like 68 to 0, and I caught no passes. And I was like, yeah, let's just stay the quarterback. <laughs> so, two years later, I moved back to quarterback and I ended up breaking NCAA records. I played for Houston Nutt, which uh, he was the head coach of University of Arkansas. His first gig as head coach was uh, at Murray State. And so, uh, if you're a football fan, the record that I broke was uh, I went 19 for 19 to start the game that broke the high deadness record for BYU. Then I thought I was going to go to the NFL. I didn't make it. So I ended up going to Germany to play in the German football league. And when I got there, obviously, you can tell I'm a black guy from the West End. When I got there, they, I wanted to go to some bars and some nightclubs. And the only thing I heard was, like techno music, right? Like house music. And I'm like, where is the soul? Where is the hip hop music, right? And so I looked at MTV and I saw that they had uh, African rappers with hard accents that were making rap music in Germany. And I said, if they can do that, I know that I can do that. So I ended up meeting some music producers and I had no idea that I would make a hit song, but they took me to the studio, they told me to make a song. I made the song I had never rapped before in my life. And, uh, and so I ended up getting a top 20 hit in Germany and uh, in Europe. I went to France. I was number 14 in France and went to Beirut to do a concert in front of 50,000 Lebanese. And we were number one in, in Lebanon. All right. So again, I thought I was going to uh, make millions of dollars playing football and making music, but it didn't happen. So I had to stop playing football and uh, came back to America. And uh, I started working for a company called Hotels.com at that time, it was called Hotel Reservation Network before it sold. Uh, it went public and sold to Expedia for $1.4 billion. And I had no idea what a stock option package was, but I was fortunate enough to be in the right situation when I came back to America, I had no corporate America spirit experience. I had I was in, in uh, sports and entertainment, and then I was going into the, the, the music, uh, the uh, corporate America, and I only had sales skills. I want to tell you the story about how I got the sales skills, but I so used to sell books door to door, and that's what I learned how to how to sell. Right, so I got this sales job, and they gave me a stock option package, and a couple of years later, we sold the company for one point four billion dollars. That's why. Learned about stock option packages, mergers, and acquisitions. And I was a part of two mergers and acquisitions uh, for $1.7 billion, and I was pretty much at the right place at the right time. So then I knew that I was going to get this cash out when we sold the company at, uh, in 2018. And I was thinking about what is it that I'm going to do after you know, corporate America. And so I knew that you know, coming from the West End and you know, living in Germany, and the company that I worked for in Dallas, uh, Hotels.com, when I traveled back to Louisville, I could see the de deterioration of the community that I grew up in, right? It's not, it wasn't the same uh, when I grew up 25, 30 years ago. The family structures were there, people took care of their lawns. It was, it was, the West End was a great place to grow up. And so when I saw this deterioration, I thought to myself, 
what is it that I can do to help the community that I grew up in? And so we started Responsible Success, and it started really as like a crowdfunding type of website similar to GoFundMe. So we would find students, we would see what needs they were, needs they have, and then I would call my buddies and friends and raise the money, and then we would help these kids stay on the path for success. And we have in education, health, housing, income, and skills. And so I knew that I couldn't do this all alone. So I pulled in Brother Lamar Young, who was a partner of ours, and Bethany, which were the founders of Sponsor for Success. Lamar, all three of us grew up in the West End, but we moved away and became successful in our career. So the model is to find students who grew up, people who grew up in the West End, are in the community, who are successful, and we aggregate our resources and we bring them back and we have support. So Lamar works for Amazon, and Bethany works for BP. And from there, we have expanded our uh, team, our board of directors. We got five people here that we added to the team uh, that are based here in Uh We've got Carol who helps us from the international standpoint. She used to live in South Africa and we just expanded into uh, the African market. We just returned from Ghana. And we also have uh, over 3,000 people that have made donations. We've got different partnerships in the community uh, that we collaborate with. Uh, that's in the name on the right hand side. We've got police officers that are involved with that. That's uh, that is Soledad O'Brien uh, from New York, who has uh, invested in us as well. And this was our trip to Ghana, which we uh, returned, I think it was about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And I'll just stop and pause here uh, and just give a, a few seconds on my experience in Africa. Um, you know, I love my high school. Global middle high school. But one of the, if I had a pet peeve, would be my learning experience of Africa was pretty much zero. Everything that I learned about Africa was about AIDS, about dysfunction, it was about corruption, uh, it was about disease. So the images that I had in my head about Africa were negative before I actually even went. And so I had met uh, in Germany many Ghanaians that told me that Africa is not what you think of, think it is, and the perspective that America puts on it. And so everything that I thought was incorrect. Obviously, there is disease, obviously, there is poverty, but it's nothing like I had imagined. So we had a great time. We set up shop to expand our operations in Ghana. We have an office that we're setting up in Accra. And from there, we're going to uh, fly to Johannesburg, South Africa, to set up shop in uh, South Africa in November. All right, so our organization, I started out as a very small organization. Uh, really, we started in 2017, which we uh, converted to a nonprofit organization. And we spent pretty much the whole entire year trying to just do the paperwork with with getting you know everything legal for a nonprofit 501c3. 2018, we jumped up a little bit. We went down in 2019. Uh, obviously, the uh, COVID hit, and so we were kind of figuring out what what it is that we were going to do. And uh, 2020, we had some great partnerships with like the Gates Foundation, James Brown, James Brown Brown, um, the Urban League. And we shot up to $325,000 last year. And this year we're on pace to do probably about $750,000. We've already did $615,000 so far year to date. And that officially puts our organization at a million dollars raised in the last five years since we started. So these are some of the things that we do from helping students. This is a young lady by the name of Torinay who went to Mandy. We won't hold that against her. Um, so uh, uh, Torinay is was, was a student at Mandy when she was part of the White Pass, and she was one of the top performers, the top singers, and her organist or her uh, choir was going to Costa Rica on a uh, kind of like an educational tour and to perform and. 
her mother was not able to afford the trip for her. So we stepped in, it was like $4,000. We raised the money and we paid for her to go to Costa Rica. And had we not stepped in, it's very possible that she would not have been able to go. And so that's part of what our model is, is to find these students or find these organizations that are already on the path to a success, but they come up financially short a little bit and then we step in and help continue them on the path to a success. Now, obviously we can't say that they're gonna be successful because she went on the trip, but she has, the op she has options or she has an opportunity to stay on their path. So we've helped over 400 students, raised over 200,000 just for uh, that area. Now, this is uh, an example of what we're doing in the community in the housing uh, piece. So we take grants from Humana, for example, gave us $250,000 to kind of build out this affordable rental program, which we're in really kind of in a space uh, by ourselves uh, because we're in the single family home uh, uh, part of affordable housing versus building apartments or large complexes. So we take these single family homes that are abandoned uh, and we go in and re rehab them and we put renters in them at affordable rates. So obviously there's investment coming into the West End. We want to, we know that gentrification is coming, displacement is coming. And as this development comes in, what are the residents that have been there for 25 years? What are they going to do? So we, we remodel these houses and we rent them out at affordable rates for low market rents. Below market rents. Uh, this is a part of our organization that uh, kind of protects the culture and the history of the West End. If you don't know this man, this is uh, Joe Hammond. He's passed away probably 20 to 25 years ago, but he used to be the owner of Joe's Palm Room. And uh, Joe's Palm Room was one of the greatest uh, jazz clubs in the nation back in the 50s and the 60s. And uh, when Joe passed away, he left all his assets to not all of them, but uh, many of his assets to Bellamy University. And the Bellamy University rented out uh, the building. And uh, there was another organization that uh, was running the business. And when they went out of business, they sold, they were going to sell the building. And so I went in to try to buy the building and found out that Bellamy University owned it. And I had never been to really Joe's Palm. My mom has been to Joe's Palm. My dad, grandma. Um, and so at that point, when I found out that it was up for sale, I started to do the history. I started to look into the history of who the owner was. And it's amazing that Joe Hannon was one of the most quiet, he was one of the most influential black men that has ever come through the world. If you wanted to be the mayor back in those days, you had to go through Joe if you wanted to have the black vote. And so this was some history, some legacy that we thought that was going unrecognized. So we purchased the, the rights to Joe's Palm Room, we purchased the rights to Joe's name, and we're building um, we're building a, uh, a, a intellectual property website and documentary all around the life of Johan. One day I would love to have a Johan Street. I think I don't see how And so uh, we are involved in a project at uh, uh, Fifth and Broadway, which is the host, it's going to be a hotel indigo. Partner is not our project, but the partner is uh, Tim Pitcher uh, from Whitestone Development. He owns the building. And he heard about the Joe Hatton concept and things that we were doing. And funny thing about Hotel Indigo is with this hotel, it needs a neighborhood story. And so when he found out about the story, then uh, he wanted Joe Hatton to be a part of this hotel. And so we would want to open, we're trying to open a, a jazz bar here in the name of Joe Hatton and also a restaurant in the name of Joe Hatton. So everybody wants to have with that. We're talking. <laughs> So uh, then there's the development at 19 Mile Mile League Boulevard. That's a difficult development, but that's a part of the Beach Terrace uh, development where McCormick Barron is the residential uh, developer and we were asked to be the commercial developer that would provide a retail center <laughs> that provides services and amenities uh, that are needed in the community. And so we want, we hope, that we can build a grocery store there, uh, maybe a pharmacy, maybe put a restaurant there and some other uh, smaller shops. Right? So it's a 30,000 square foot development. It is in conceptual phase. And so if you want to help me with that one, <laughs> we can talk about it after this. And we also have built our offices at uh, Ninth Mile Valley Boulevard. We built, we started our organization with 
aggregating people from around the world that grew up in the West End. And then we and we actually operated virtually for a while, me coming from the online travel industry. I could be anywhere in the world and still do my job. And so I was I was familiar with working uh, virtually. Uh, but we thought that we needed a presence in Louisville. We were going to keep doing business in Louisville. So we are uh, part of the Molo Village uh, development. We got 2,000 square feet of building. Uh, we, we built it out, and now we're just kind of putting it in the office. If you want to talk about any of the projects that we are involved in, we can meet at our offices, the 13th at Mahala, 13th in Johnson. Uh, we also do a lot of community events. Uh, we've done the Joe Hammond event, two of those. We've done two, two derby events. We've done California Day. And so we try to, I think that's one of our advantages is that we are from the community. I got 500 cousins and people that I work with have cousins as well. <laughs> and so we are pretty much, we know every corner of the West End. And that's pretty our focus is kind of developing the West End. And so, you know, anytime there's a large corporation, large foundation that wants to come into the West End, we are a good, good organization to, to start with because we pretty much know where we are. All right, so I'm going to try to explain this. All these things that uh, I did uh, and our organization has done, if you know us, you know that we've done it without a plan. Like We don't sit down and put together elaborate plans and talk about what it is that we are going to do and before we make action or do action, it's you know, it's got to be written down. And so we basically say this is what we want to do. Say it's open a shop in Africa. We start booking flights and we go and we figure it out. Right. So I was trying to explain this in more of a like scientific type of way. So I did some research on some like behavior economics is like way over my head. So I'm gonna try to explain this. So basically, these researchers say that there's an internal struggle that we have with ourselves about our, our current life and what our future life wants, uh, what we want out of our future life. And so there's always this debate on what it is that we want, which affects our decisions. And so uh, similar to, uh, I think it's Roy who said, you have the id, the ego, and the super ego. I broke myself down into three people. Right? I've got Vreeman, who is like the analyst. He's always looking at the past. I've got Bush Mo, who's like a party guy. He's like, he doesn't really care. He's just like doing whatever. And then you got Mr. Mosby, which is the visionary, right? And so basically, we set these goals in the future as the visionary, and then go back and talk to Bush Mo and Green about, are you going to help me achieve these goals? You can't sit around and make plans all day long. You can't be at the bar all day long. You can't party all day long if you want to achieve some of these goals. And basically, it comes down to this gap between your future self and your current self. And in between that gap, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And if you don't do the work, you're not going to achieve these goals. And so I'll leave you with that. You don't necessarily need a plan, but you need to set your goals and you need to do the work. Thank you, Butch. Well, your, your journey is remarkable, and uh, what you've already been able to accomplish is, is certainly very impressive. We appreciate you coming to speak to us, Rotary. We've got time for a few questions. If uh, Rotarians, you want to come to, to the microphone and ask a question, um, we would love to hear from you. Barbara Sexton Smith. <laughs> Yes. Hey, Bush, if I heard you correctly, did you say you would want to talk about an honorary street sign for <laughs> Joe Hayman? Absolutely. Okay. I specialize in that. Okay. So, all right. I okay. All right. So, and also, if I may, there's a, may I ask a second question again? <laughs> okay. Uh, you spoke about the affordable rental rates in the apartments yes. that you were doing. Or the home, the single family homes that you're doing. Yes. Do you see, or are you all talking about a pathway to home ownership for those folks or others? Yes. So our organization is not, um, but there are organizations out there that do talk about home ownership. And so our program, uh, which is in partnership with the Rural Urban League, 
uh, we teach uh, like financial literacy or urban teach the financial literacy before you can get one of our affordable rentals, you have to pass that course. And so our program is designed for you to come in and because you have a lower rental rate, it allows you to have more income to do whatever it is you need to do to support your family. But we don't want you to live with us for 20 years. So it's kind of like a stepping stone. So hopefully uh, you will continue just to be a part of the Urban League and go through their home ownership program. And then you may stay two years with us, three years with us, and then you graduate into the home ownership. Industry. So our organization not focused on it 100%, but we lead them into a home ownership program. Great talk. I'm Larry Sloan and uh, retired uh, independent salesman. So I worked on the trade commissions my whole career and traveled all over. And I've been to Africa with Rotary, and Africa is amazing. Uh, and it was an eye opening experience. We were looking at water projects that Africa had, uh, I mean, that Rotary had funded, and we were in Kenya. And I'm going to tell people here that people in Africa are wonderful, but friendly. They're helpful. They're they're really don't be scared to go to Africa. Africa is a wonderful place to visit. I've been back to Africa since I was there. That's a comment, so it's not a question. But my question is this: You talk about you don't have a plan. You just go do it. And but what about a vision? You have a vision about where you might want to be rather than a plan. In other words, you see yourself out here in in that graph you had of there's a vision of uh, of you but how does that connect to where you've been and the path you've been on which is an amazing story thank you yeah so so that uh, in that diagram uh, the visionary was mr mosby right and so uh, mr mosby he kind of runs wild with his imagination and vision sometimes right because now you know, our my vision for our organization since we've been in Africa is to be an organization, a global organization that works with the largest nonprofits in the world and the largest corporations in the world. Right? We're very long ways away from that. Um, but if I can set those visions as the leader of the company, set those visions with my executive team, if I can set those visions and then we work our way backwards and get the right people in place to help us achieve these goals then it's very possible, right? And so, you know, sometimes, you know, we, in my opinion, we cut, we, we cut ourselves short because our vision, our goals are not big enough. And so we end up doing small things, uh, small things that are important, but they not, may not allow you to grow and to, to do something big. So, you know, for our organization, our vision is very big. Right? And we know that we can't do it without partnerships and without collaborations. And so part of the reason of me coming to speak to you and when I go speak to the Urban League or whatever, whoever it else it may be, you know, we're looking for partners to help us achieve our goals. So, Bud, yeah, thank you for a great presentation and thank you for being a sponsor for success. Creating your hometown in our community, Louisville. Um, I also want to thank you for you know, the success story of Tornay, you know, she was also a protege of mine when she was a, in elementary school and had her as a part of our rising fifth graders program at the Urban League and she was a struggling reader and now knows she's in New York City, uh, an aspiring performing artist and that you have her back. We really appreciate that. So I just want to have a question uh, about uh, success, uh, being a sponsor for success. But I wanted you to kind of unpack for this Rotary Club, what kinds of challenges that have you experienced in here in your hometown? What are the barriers and the obstacles to success that you are facing as you come back here in Louisville and really want to do great impact work? Wow, okay, that's a loaded question, man. That's <laughs> loaded. Uh, so, so yeah, so I guess I'll go down this road. Um, when I got my, I grew up in the West End, right? and so, you know, the whole goal is when, when you get out is you know, become successful in your, your career, or your, in your lane. And, you know, I had a mom, I made it 
moment when we sold the company two or three years ago. So I got my cash out and able to retire from corporate America. And so when I came back to Louisville, I thought that the money that I had was going to allow me to get into the boys club. And so, you know, I joined a couple of organizations. I, you know, I tried to build relationships. I tried to build partnerships that was do uh, the thing, the work kind of work that we wanted to do. And it was, and I had been gone for 25 years. I was having my high school classmates and things like that. But, you know, it was more along the lines of who's on your board. If they're not on your board, we're not letting you in. Right. So, you know, I had a very difficult time in the city that I grew up in building relationships and building partnerships because nobody knew who I was and I didn't have specific people on my board. Right. And that's just one, one piece. Okay. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, the West End and the kind of work that we're involved in. It's so fragmented. Uh, if you don't, if you're not part of the right clique, then, you know, you don't get to get this deal. Right. And so I found myself leading our organization with people outside of Louisville. Right? And so the money pool in Louisville was very limited. So if I need money, I'll go outside of Louisville. Right? And so now, after five years, you know, some of those challenges are breaking down. And so we know more people, we have more partnerships, we have more collaborations. And now I think that our organization is headed in the right direction, direction with the partnerships in Louisville and the global, the people of Louisville can help us do what we want to do, not only locally, but globally. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, time for one more quick question. All right. Well, I thanks very much uh, for sending your story, Tommy Sturgeon. Uh, and I do agree, plan can become a cap. So you got to be careful. You don't want to limit yourself. Uh, my, my question is, I, I was concerned hearing you speak about that you've seen a significant deterioration in the past, you know, even 30 years here in West End. So for, for a group like us, any organizations in Louisville, particularly us, are there things that you could see groups like Rotary focusing on to, to address that deterioration, that problem specifically? Uh, yes, absolutely. Right? <laughs> so, you know, I think that um, you know, it's easy for me to come in and say, hey, I want you guys to start writing checks. But the money itself is not going to solve the problem, right? I think. What solves the problem? And I'm a part of a group at the Community Foundation of Louisville called the Fund Holder uh, Impact Group. It's a bunch of fund holders that get together and talk about the problems of the city and try to uh, come up with solutions for it. Right. So in this group, we invite different people from around the community to come to talk to us, and these influential people they get involved because they are aware of what's going on now. Right. So, you know, Louisville has this nice street divide, and it's more than just, you know, a physical barrier between the east side and the west side of town. Right. It's a psychological bar barrier as well. And the east side of town has no idea what the west side of town is doing. And it's probably vice versa. And so I would say reach out to people who are doing work in the community, learn about what it is that they're doing. And then once you are aware, then you can decide how your organization wants to get involved. Okay, right? so hopefully that answers your question. Presentation, I really appreciate that and all the great work that you're doing. Um, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our Paul Harris fellows to the stage. And invite to the stage uh, Craig Mooney, Tom Crimmins, and Barbara Sexton Smith. And for those here today who have earned their Paul Harris Fellow pins, please stand and be recognized. Appreciation for the many ways in which you exemplify Rotary's model of service above self. And on behalf of the women and men of our Rotary Club, it is my honor and pleasure to recognize you today as a Paul Harris Fellow. 
As a pioneer, fell on your promoting peace, fighting disease, providing clean water, saving mothers and children, supporting education, and growing local economies. You are also pro providing funds for matching district grants that support projects in our community and other communities in Louisville. On behalf of the trustees of the Rotary Foundation, it's my pleasure to present to you these emblems of a Paul Harris Fellow. Craig Rooney. Tom Truman is a Pires fellow ten times four. <laughs> Smith is a Pires fellow ten times five. <laughs> service, we urge you to wear your Pires fellow pen as a symbol of our creative appreciation for you for your humanitarian efforts, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me once again in congratulating and recognizing our Paul Harris fellows. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite Brett Corbin back to the microphone for our announcements today. All right. Uh, I'm Brett Corbin, financial advisor from the Corbin Financial Group of Raymond James. I understand the announcements have been going a little long lately, so I'm here to kind of edit them a little bit. <laughs> Next week's meeting is October 21st, and our speaker will be Lauren Coulter, owner of Biscuit Billy. Uh, lunch will be the best local Kentucky hop round you've ever tasted. Uh, you won't want to miss the meeting. Uh, October 19th from 5 to 7. Our new next business uh, synergy event will be happening, and that'll be at Jeff Underhill's latest creation, the Swiss Village. So just in time for winter. Uh, formerly known as Swiss Park and Swiss Hall, this site and building have a strong connection to the Swiss immigrant community um, that lived in Germantown in the St. Joseph's neighborhood. Uh, located on Lynn Street between Shelby and Preston, the park was created in 1925 by the Gruel uh, Helvetia Society, a Swiss association formed in 1850. Jeff and his team have reimagined this area with new and affordable housing and green living spaces. You won't want to miss that event. And Rotary Golf Day uh, was this past Monday. Uh, luckily, our four-way test kept things, things very honest, so uh, as many uh, 20 under pars. Uh, the weather was near perfect. Uh, the winners for the longest drive was John Duffy. Uh, longest drive two was Ryan Mattingly. Longest putt was Rick King. Uh, longest putt two, no, nobody made it one there. <laughs> there were only four teams, so, you know, we didn't have much going there. Uh, best golf attire was Kenny G. Congrats. We expect nothing less. Uh, best golf attire female was Angie uh, Bailey. And thank you to our uh, sponsors, Ugly Dog Distillery, made in Louisville, Cliff Elgin Consulting, uh, Rotarians had so much fun we forgot to take any pictures. <laughs> uh, we appreciate you registering for the meeting next week in advance. Please use the QR code there. And they, those reservations close tomorrow at 4 p.m. And that's a deadline the restaurant requires. All right, uh, birthdays. One, uh, Thomas Roth, October 15th. Happy birthday, Thomas, if you're here. And back to you, Mr. Kenji. We've got a few Rotarians we haven't seen in a while. We call them missing in action. Go check the names and call one of your friends and invite them to come to a meeting soon. And Rotarians, please scan the QR codes at your tables to register for, register for next week's meeting. I don't see Craig Sherman here. I don't hear it. Craig Sherman is here. Okay, so Craig is our leading our What is Rotary? Uh, those of you who are guests. Uh, come see Craig and he'll fill you in on all the great things we're doing on Rotary now to become a part of us. This is the best part. Thank <laughs> you. 